Hi, this is Cal Ripken Jr., and you're listening to the ML Sports Platter. The MLSP is back with you. Download, subscribe, leave feedback, and a five-star review where you get podcasts on your smartphone device. We're brought to you by Liverpool Physical Therapy, the Vince Aguirre Consulting Group, Welch and Company Jewelers, and our great, great buddy Brian Conboy of Mass Mutual New York State. Get your financial future set with Brian today. Advisors.massmutual.com. Sit down with them. Really map out the future. Maybe you're retiring, sending a youngster off to college. Things get scary. Money gets tight. Brian can help you out. Man, he opened our eyes to a bunch of new things. And on the regular, I am updated uh, on my retirement. And I am so pleased that we chose Brian for our financial future. Brian Convoy of Mass Mutual New York State. Tax-efficient retirement planning today on Facebook, on LinkedIn, and also advisors.massmutual.com. I am super pumped to talk to the next guest of the ML Sports Platter. He's a pal of mine and just does an incredible, incredible job covering Uh, The Bay Area sports, we're going to focus a little bit on the second half of the surprising team in baseball, the San Francisco Giants. He's a podcast host and an insider, Uh, also catches work, Pac-12 Network, CBS Sports, play-by-play, 30-plus years covering sports. The sportsvirus.com is where he can get his work, Uh, and of course, on Twitter, at the sportsvirus. It's my good buddy, Joe Castellano. We're going to also recap the All-Star Game Home Run Derby and and look at some other storylines in MLB for the second half. Joe, how are you, buddy? Welcome. Hey, great to be with you, Mike. Okay, let's recap the Home Run Derby All-Star Game. What were some of your takeaways? I thought, you know, despite the the uniforms being horrendous, and I know we were texting about that, uh, and the game, you know, being pulled out of Atlanta, which pissed me off, I actually thought the game was solid, um, really competitive, great moments. Vlad Jr. hits a bomb, wins MVP, uh, first time ever that the that, that, that somebody who won the game uh, got the MVP and uh, closed the game out all come from international uh, soil uh, outside the United States. And I thought just overall the game was pretty solid. And let's face it, some people are just meant for certain things, and Pete Alonso was meant for the Home Run Derby. Oh, yeah. And it was very entertaining, everything from the Home Run Derby to the game. I agree with you about the uniforms. I don't know why they would change from – having the players wear their team uniform. I mean, that's the one sport, baseball, that was doing it right. Why change from that? I mean, you really couldn't distinguish. It was it was nice when you had a couple of players on, let's say, the Dodgers or the Padres or the Mets, and, and you could just tell who it was. And right away, in, in this case, it was a lot harder. <laughs> I mean, I thought those were, would be good uniforms maybe if it was for Team USA or something like that, but mm-hmm. not for the All-Star game. So that was a big mistake, I thought, to go away from that. And I don't know if they'll... Uh, go back to the old way in the future. But uh, starting with the home run derby, yeah, that was a lot of fun. I mean, especially watching Shohei, even though he didn't get to the final. I mean, Otani was fun to watch. Uh, You know, the amount of power these guys have, the way the ball was carrying over there at Coors Field. And, yeah, Pete Alonso, I mean, he really enjoys it, really wants to win it. So it's nice to see him do that. And the game itself, I mean, that was awesome to watch uh, all these players. Uh, Unfortunately, from our side out here in San Francisco, only one player in the game, Brandon Crawford, and he had one at bat, and that's it. And he, he had an error in the field, so it wasn't great as far as that's concerned. But I thought the telecast was pretty entertaining, too. Some of the interviews they did were a little impossible to try to pull off. You know, a guy at the plate while he's hitting, or a pitcher who, you know, <laughs> Hendricks didn't hear them when they were trying to interview him, and he ended up swearing on the air. So maybe it was a little more entertaining than, than we wanted it to be. But, I mean, overall, the, the whole event was great. I mean, I think MLB pulled it off pretty well. Okay. Let's get to some some second. And by the way, the uniform thing, look, if you're going to change it out of, I, I'm with you. They did it the right way for so long. You know, wearing your own uniform, it was just, a, it's a special deal to wear your own uniform in the All-Star game. But if you're going to change, I don't necessarily mind a change here and there, but good God, not to dish rags. You know, I, I don't want to see them wearing <laughs> dish rags. Like, make a good uniform. I I actually thought the helmets, I thought the helmets were pretty solid, but, man, the uniforms were awful. Let's get to some second-half stuff. You brought up Shohei. Does Shohei Otani have sustainability, do you think, long-term? This year, I have no doubts, but do you think he can do this for, you know, three, five, seven, ten more years? Out on the pitching side, probably not. I mean, I don't know. I think, you know, it's going to be hard for him to be able to pull off doing both. I mean, he's just a, such a natural hitter, though, so I think he can 
do that for a long time. I mean, why not ride it out, though, as long as you can? Mm-hmm. Uh, this is so exciting to see him try to do both. It is amazing that he doesn't take batting practice. It probably would burn him out if he was taking batting practice on the field right. every day. So, uh, you know, while he's young enough to do it, great. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I don't see that being sustainable for a long-term plan, as for, especially on the mound, because, I mean, that's where I think it's going to be tougher for him to be able to, you know, concentrate on that and stay away from injury, which, you know, he's already had some issues. Tell you what, he's already 27, man. And, you know, those Japanese guys, they put a lot of miles on before they even get here, whether it's a hitter or a pitcher for that matter. I mean, they play a grueling game. Uh, most of the time it's in, like the Yomari Giants, I think they play inside a dome, right? So they're playing on that hard turf. If you're a pitcher, forget about it. Uh, you're, you're, you're all right. You know, 26 is, you're really 30-31 in terms of seasons. So I, I just wonder, I just wonder. And you know what else is too bad, too? I mean, here, here's this guy on the Angels. I mean, it's the same thing as Trout. You know, he, here he is. Trout's injured. Best player in the game. Otani takes over for him as best player in the game. Hybrid guy. We've never seen this before. And he's on the same team, the team that never goes to the postseason. We won't, we won't see Otani in October. Joe? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's kind of hard. You can't really control who the face of the game is going to be. And, and by the way, I'll ask you what you think about him being the face of the game, being that he does use an interpreter. I think it's fine. I mean, I, I really like Otani. I think if a guy's a great player, he could still be sure. the face of the game. He's always smiling. It's not like he has some scowl on him and and he's you know disappointing young fans or anything like that so i think it's fine i mean stephen a smith didn't initially and then had to p- apologize for his comments but i'm curious what you think about it i i'm okay with with shohei otani being the face for sure and i'll tell you why the game is not i mean it's it's very international now we have a ton of players from the latin countries we have players from australia liam hendricks is from australia we've got shohei mm-hmm. from japan we got players from all over the freaking place, man. Cuba, the Caribbean, uh, Japan, I, I'm Korea. I'm I'm down. I'm down with it. I don't care. You know. And by the way, for years and years and years, Derek Jeter um, was the face of baseball, right? And he never gave great media quotes. He gave, you know, he he stuck to his guns and good for him. He has to shortstop of the Yankees, the pressure and 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 you know being under the microscope all the time. But it's not like Derek Jeter gave us, you know. Brooks Kepka, Bryson DeChambeau rivalry quotes or something, you know, or or whatever. I mean, it, he was the face and didn't didn't really give us tons of media uh, copy. So who cares? Shohei through an uh, interpreter, whatever. And oh, by the way, when he speaks, he's still speaking to baseball fans because there's a lot of Japanese people watching him. Yeah, I mean, I agree, and I think you know it's just a matter of the interpreter being good and and trying to you know ask the right questions because people are going to want to know about him. And I thought that was one of the best things about the All Star Game. Getting back to the miking of the players mm-hmm. is that they become more human, especially when they mic a player when he's in the field. I mean, Freddie Freeman was great. Yeah. Uh, Chris Bryant was great. Those, those guys were great. Yeah. They're out in the field. They, they don't have to worry so much in an All-Star game. It, it's much more difficult when somebody's at the plate. Like, they try to talk to Bogarts, and it just it wasn't working. But but I really like that, uh, the fact that you kind of get to see the human side, and, and they're talking while they're playing a game. And, you know, it's a game that doesn't count, so it works out in a way. Joe Castellano here on the ML Sports Platter, Bay Area Sports Insider. We'll get to the Giants here in a second at the Sports Virus on Twitter and the SportsVirus.com, the terrific podcaster and uh, baseball insider and, and a good pal of mine. We're brought to you by Bryant and Stratton College and Camillus Golf Club. Joe Vlad Jr. is a beast. I saw him play for the Bisons uh, in Syracuse a couple years ago. He hit a ball right center field, and you know that park. Uh, he hit, it's very deep. It's 400 feet to center. He hit a screamer over the right center field wall, and it literally it went over the trees. And I, I'm not sure it's landed still. Um, the sound of the bat on the ball, and just I, I stopped so I could just watch the at bat because I didn't have to be anywhere with my on field gig. And you know that's why you go to the games, man. That's why you go watch guys like Vlad Jr. because of what's happening. Now he wins the home run derby, or excuse me, the uh, MVP in the All Star game. He's a guy now who could be challenging Shohei for the MVP. When you watch him, two-part question, when you watch him, what do you see? And inside that, similarities, differences from, you know, w- with his dad when he played and swung the bat with that crazy, there, there was never a bad ball for Vlad Jr., of, of Vlad Sr., right? So do you see similarities, differences, and, and what do you see there with Vlad Jr.? Yeah, I think that's the biggest difference is that Vlad Sr. would swing at everything. I haven't seen enough of Jr. to, to know, uh, you know, everything about his strike zone, but from what I've heard, uh, it seems like you know he swings at more strikes than his dad did, but 
the prodigious power. I mean, he, he probably has more power than his dad did. I mean, you're describing that home run. And there's something about those big home runs that you never forget them. Like this one in the All-Star game, of course. But even in Syracuse, uh, you know, you think about the stadium there now. You go back to MacArthur Stadium. It used to be 434 yeah. to straightaway center yep. field. And Carlos Delgado, I think, was the only player to, to clear that fence. Uh, and people would talk about that. I was there that one year in 96. Carlos Delgado. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so people never forget <laughs> home runs like that. I remember when I was in Rochester, Tim Laker hit one oh, over the scoreboard man. in left field at Frontier Field, and that's one you just never forget, you yeah. know? Yeah, no doubt. I remember back at, you know, Big Mad, Carlos Delgado is my favorite chief of all time. I remember, you know, now batting the first baseman, Carlos. I don't know who was doing P- <laughs> who was doing PA then. Was that was that you? Was it Chris Granosio? Was it Granosio? Uh, was there when I was there. Yeah. I'll I'll, t- I'll text him later and find out. It, it might have been, but um, all right. Let's get to in the last few minutes that I have with you. Let's get to the team you're closest to out there on the West Coast, the San Francisco Giants, a team that. Let's face it, they're, they're, they're on the dance floor with, uh, with two others. We didn't expect to have room for the Giants on the dance floor, but yet here they are going into the second half up two games on the Dodgers and six better than the Padres. What's worked for them in the first half, and can they make a push and win this division in the second half? Oh, I definitely think they can make the push. As far as your first question, what's worked, it's starting pitching and depth. Uh, you know, it's amazing this starting pitching because, I mean, we knew that Gosman was good, but yeah. we didn't know he'd be a Cy Young Award candidate type pitcher, an all star pitcher. Uh, Dee Scalfani deserved to be in the all star game. Uh, he wasn't put on that roster, but he's been amazing as well. So you got those two guys and Alex Wood, and then, you know, just other players, pitchers that have stepped up. The bullpen has been decent. I mean, it's depth, though. I mean, <laughs> you've had injuries to players like Evan Longoria and Brandon Belt, and right now Buster Posey being out, and other players have stepped in, and they make hockey line changes during the game where they pinch hit for hitters in the fifth or sixth inning. I mean, Gabe Kapler, it seems like it's nuts. Uh, he's pinched hit for hitters like Tommy Lestella when he was healthy. He was three for three in a game, and he got pinched hit for. But it still works. Somehow it works for this team, all of these platoons, and they lead the major leagues not only in best record, but also in home runs, which that was never a consideration, especially playing at Oracle Park where it's big and it's more of a pitcher's park. But they've had so many different contributors. I mean, you look at Brandon Crawford, and he's hitting a bunch of home runs, but they've had a lot of different hitters step up and hit home runs, and that's why they have the most. So those are the areas where you know they've really done a great job, and I don't see that changing. Their schedule is going to be tough right out of the gate, right out of the all-star break. They've got seven of ten games in a stretch coming up here against the Dodgers. So that's really going to determine who's going to take hold of this division a little bit. But I don't see either team running away or the Padres. All three are really going to be going for it in the second half. You know, we look at, Joe, successful teams, playoff teams, championship caliber, you know, contending teams. You look at a major column in Major League Baseball, and that is run differential. The Giants yeah. are plus one sixteen, man. I mean, gosh, that number is it, it just it, it's right in front of you. You can't ignore that. You look at the other teams in baseball: Dodgers plus one forty two, Padres plus seventy five, plus forty six for the Brewers. Uh, shockingly, the Braves are at plus nineteen. I don't know how that's happening, but you know, you look at Houston plus one thirty six, the White Sox running away with the AL Central plus one seventeen. Boston, great year. Tampa, great year. Plus 57, plus 85. Toronto, plus 72. Joe, that plus 116, that's a big deal for the Giants. That's a huge reason why they're where they are. Yeah, I mean, you know, the offense is a lot better than people expected. I think it started to come on last year during the short season that we had. Yep. Uh, And you started to see guys like Yastrzemski that were uh, delivering for them. And, you know, just unknown guys like an Austin Slater. And this year... Steven Duggar, you know, kind of came out of nowhere for people because he was in the minor leagues at the beginning of the year. So they, they really can come back from deficits, and that's why, you know, they've got that run differential. They're, they're never out of a game. Uh, you know, it seems like if they give their pitcher a lead, it's, it's going to hold because they've had such good starting pitching. And, and the bullpen had a really bad stretch earlier in the season where I thought that was going to be the Achilles heel. But I'll tell you, Tyler Rogers, as a setup guy, has been amazing with this submarine-style pitching. Hitters have not been able to figure him out. 
Let me sneak one more in here. Before we did the interview, we were talking a little bit about, you know, they're going to finally do the induction in Cooperstown. No, no uh, inductees for 2021, so celebrating 2020, you're late. It's weird. It's, it's at, you know, right at school starting here in, uh, in the upstate New York region. It's on a Wednesday. Yeah, whatever. I, you know, if this is what it takes to get it done and, and to see it and celebrate, you know, Jeter and Walker and others, I'm all in on it. My question for you is this. You're as big a baseball guy as anybody I know, and I know how much respect you have for Jeter and his playing days. What do, you, what do you remember the most from his career, Joe? You know, it's funny. I mean, from his overall career, I, I just picture him being consistent and very professional. Uh, but it's the little moments, just him hitting the ball to right field, you know, going the other way, moving the runner up, that kind of stuff. Things that the, we the don't see in the game, game today. We miss Derek Jeter's yeah. fundamental play. Yeah, exactly that. And I'll tell you the one image, it's funny. I was at a Yankees game. And it was kind of in the middle of his career. I can't remember what year it was, but I was at a Yankee, at Yankees game, and he hit a ground ball to shortstop. And he ran so hard to first, he was thrown out, but he just ran hard to first pace. Yeah. And that just sticks in my mind because yeah. you don't always see that on a routine ground ball. That's a, that's a great answer. Joe Castellano covering it all. The Giants, 49ers, the Warriors, the podcast host. Catch him on the Pac-12 Network, CBS Sports, and the play-by-play side. 30-plus years covering sports, Bay Area Sports Insider, MLB uh, analyst as well, at the Sports Virus on Twitter. Make sure you follow him, thesportsvirus.com. Joe Castellano, you're the best. Great catching up with you. Hopefully it uh, won't be <laughs> too much longer we can connect. I still got to get out to San Fran to see that ballpark. I'm dying to see that place. Oh, yeah, now that they're letting all the fans in and everything, you got to come out here. It's, it's an awesome stadium, and uh, you're going to really enjoy it when you get a chance to do it. Joe, take care. Thank you, bud. Thanks, Mike. Hey, that was awesome. Appreciate it. Huge thanks to Joe Castellano, man. He is a tremendous, tremendous guest. The ML Sports Platter is brought to you by your great friends at Bryant and Stratton College. Go ahead and log on to bryantstratton.edu today. Find out more about how to become a Bobcat. And if you're in and around Central New York, they have two tremendous, tremendous locations uh, in the city on James Street and in Liverpool. Bryantstratton.edu. Two and four-year degrees are starting soon Make sure you go check them out online, fill out the questionnaire and more. Uh, I think it's nine questions in all to help kind of shape what, what you need, what, what you're looking to do. Um, it's terrific. Academics, ex, uh, athletics, and excellence all happening now at Bryant and Stratton College. Uh, a big tip of the cap thank you as well to Welch & Company Jewelers, the Swan and Whitaker families for their support of the podcast, as well as our good buddies over at Barks & Rec Doggy Daycare. So get this, I went on a great show uh, with Sean Crew out in uh, Seattle, uh, ESPN Seattle, Northwest Golf Show. Uh, we recapped uh, the U.S. Open and much, much more. And I wanted to play that spot for you here on the ML Sports Platter. The Golf Show on 710 ESPN Seattle. Welcome back to The Golf Show with Sean Crew on 710 ESPN Seattle. Mike Lindsley, host of ML Sports Platter, is with me now for Hashtag Golf. <laughs> Turning story number one. Well, there were a few things trending over the weekend, things that if you hadn't seen with your own eyes, you may find it hard to believe. But from Mackenzie Hughes' golf ball landing in a tree to Brian Harmon's four putting within five feet. And of course, the streaker. Let's see here, Mike. So let's start with Hughes. He was coming in off of a par on 10 and then pulled this tee shot on the long par 3 11th hole. TV cameras struggled to follow where the ball landed, but as it turns out, it bounced on a cart path and the ball found refuge in a tree. It was a tough break for Hughes. He was only two shots back before this happened, but finishing a hole with a double bogey, it may have been the beginning of the end of his chances to win. What did you think about that? Tough luck for sure. It's tough luck, but isn't that golf? I mean, <laughs> you know, your, your, your ball can go anywhere. I mean, I, I, I remember going to high school playing a local course. And, and completely shank one off the club, and it, it, it went into a you know somebody's passenger seat of her car. <laughs> um, so the ball can go anywhere. Uh, that's what that story tells me. And yeah, I mean, look, you, you know, you get one of those bad breaks, and that's that's where the mind part takes place in the U.S. Open. The U.S. Open is probably the greatest mental test in golf, uh, and maybe all of sports. And uh, you know, you get a bad break like that, and you know, but the, the golf ball can go anywhere. You know, it can go anywhere. All right. Well, also trending, Brian Harmon on the par four sixth hole. He was only five feet out. 
and he would have made birdie with a one putt, but then the unthinkable happened. He not only missed making that initial putt for birdie, it took him three more attempts. He ended up triple bogeying the hole, and you know, my triple bogeys are always painful, but they're really painful when you could have made birdie. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. That's another reason. I mean, there's so many. How long is the list of, of why golf is a full letter word, right? I mean, my goodness. <laughs> and and I four putted greens. I mean, I four putted last summer from. God, it wasn't that distance, but it wasn't much longer than that. Uh, it was like an uphill pin was in a bad spot, and uh, you know you, you kind of lose you kind of lose control when that's starting to happen, and um, you know that's why it's always important to kind of just step back for a second after maybe your first miss, or in his case maybe the second miss. Uh, you know, it's it, it's it's so difficult for, for for us to even comprehend what it's like to be in those situations and how difficult it is and the pressure and all the rest but golf is a four-letter word for a reason there's no doubt but we, we've all done it if somebody is, is playing is play enough golf in their life and they've not four-putted they are lying to their team. <laughs> this is true <laughs> all right. lying. no 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 it's absolutely true we've all done it in the last of this bunch on the 13th hole the streaker and, and maybe not really because he was partially clothed what was he wearing like cargo pants a pink bustier and a pride flag that doubled as a cape it was quite the spectacle he ran out on the fairway with a golf club and at one point stopped to hit a ball and i gotta say his swing actually looked pretty good under pressure considering he was being chased by security but your thoughts on this one mike i don't understand like i mean maybe maybe you're you're a couple too too many cocktails i don't don't know what what causes these people to, to do that from an attention standpoint are we trying to win a bet if you win the bet by doing it you better be making some major money because you're going to have to obviously get out of the slammer uh, after you do this. So, um, but but I've never understood it. You know, baseball. I've been at sporting events where it's happened. I've been at NFL games where it's happened. Uh, yeah, I've seen it happen at, at, at a Buffalo Bills game. I've seen it happen in many other places. Uh, I've seen people run out of the field. You know, during college football and basketball. It just doesn't make any sense. You know, people have you know agenda. You know, it's like attention, social media. These days is a big deal. Did you make a bet? I mean, there's a million reasons why somebody might do it. I just don't think any of them. I can't comprehend it. I would never want to be out there. Plus, first of all, running out just in general uh, is stupid. But then in either weird clothes, no clothes, I, I don't. I, I wouldn't be. Uh, I'm not. Put it this way. I'm not streaking anytime soon. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Trending story number two. Matthew Wolf opening up about his mental health struggles. The 22-year-old opened up at the U.S. Open talking about the stress and pressure of playing and how it has been getting to him. He talked about how he was just trying to enjoy playing and being comfortable. And even despite playing well last Thursday and Friday, he wanted to stay in bed. You know, it's interesting to hear Wolf opening up about this, but I will say this, Mike, I actually am happy he's doing it. I am too. And I think that a lot of sports fans, diehards, we, they get caught up in rah, rah, rah for my favorite team, right? Like they're, you're so attached to the wins and the losses or so attached to the sport and multiple players in, in individual competition, right? Like tennis or golf, where, you know, if you don't cover the game and you've never been around athletes, I'm not saying that because I've been around a ton of athletes in my day that I, I know them personally. That's not That's not the case, but... What I am saying is I've been around them enough to know that a lot of them are, are human beings, too. You know, you, you take that huge bank account away, you take away the sponsorship deals, you take away, you know, the private jets and all the rest. I mean, th- th- there is a human element there. And I think that all doing this is crucial. It's important for the game. It's important for people going through uh, this situation. I mean, anxiety, depression, all these things are are really, really, really important to, to address. And they're very serious. Um, and, you know, we're, we're, we're looking at the same thing happening in women's tennis. I mean, Naomi Osaka uh, has, has pulled out of tournaments at this point, major tournaments, Grand Slam tournaments, uh, to handle that. And I think she should be applauded uh, as well. Um, but I don't like it when national media people, you know, crush these athletes or, you know, come on, you're so soft. You're just a- people go through things mentally. And until you're mentally there, um, everything's going to be a challenge. So I, I hope that. You know, Matthew Wolf, and I hope that Osaka and anybody else, for that matter, in sports and not in sports, uh, professional sports, are, are, are getting the help that they need. And uh, we can kind of all have a little bit of more of an awareness for, for the seriousness of, of all these conditions because it is a big deal. It's a big deal. And we don't want to see people, you know, 
take their lives from it or go into deep, 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 deep depression where they're close to doing that. So it's a serious thing. And uh, hopefully they're setting, a, you know, a precedent here and setting the table for others to follow. Yeah, no, it is a big deal. And hopefully by speaking out, they are doing just that. <laughs> Trending story number three, Bryson DeChambeau under fire for not using a four letter word. On Saturday, playing the fourth hole, the defending champion was widely criticized by fans on social media for not yelling four and giving a courtesy warning to the gallery for his wayward shot heading their way. It wasn't the only time, and he even shared that it was part of his strategy to be hitting where fans were standing because they had helped trample down the rough, which was actually making it easier for him to hit out of. But, Mike, a lot of people not happy about the lack of courtesy. I mean, look, if you think the ball's going to go near someone, even if it's not close, in the end, but you think off the tee it could be, you yell it, right? I don't care if you're in the U.S. Open. I don't care if you're, you know, you and I playing a local public course. I mean, you yell it, right? Like, that's the bottom line. But, you know, he just doesn't seem to really care about anything besides himself. I mean, it's, you know, he, he <laughs> just seems to, and, and trust me, I don't I don't think that's a bad thing for golf. I think him being a villain, I, you know, this whole Kepka and DeChambeau battle back and forth, this, uh, you know, the match that they're going to be playing here very soon uh, with, with, with Brady and Rodgers. And I, I think this stuff is all great because it just means that we're talking about the game more and more and more and more. But the other idea might be that Bryson DeChambeau, he said that, but he really actually thought that he didn't have to yell it because the ball was just going to be way over them anyway. I and mean, he just thinks he can hit the ball over everyone and everything. You know, much like you talked about the Masters this past year, which I did, this past map was, was talking about, well, I'll just hit it over all the trees. It's, it's like, you know, nobody's ever done that in the history of the game, but, you know, you do you, pal, you know, and, and we saw what happened. I mean, he couldn't, he couldn't do it, right? So um, he's just a character, and he's approaching the game like nobody has. He's put on, what, 40, 50 pounds. He wants to put on more. Uh, he hits the ball a country mile every time out, and he just – you know, has his own little, I and mean, his mind picks in, in a way that no one else does on tour. And I think that probably, at the end of the day, explains why he didn't yell for multiple times, which, again, you have to yell for. Come on, if, if it's close to anybody, you got to at least yell it. You should. And that's something that's been a big debate for a while now. Not the first time that Bryson's been leading the conversation on this, and unfortunately, probably not the last. Mike Lindsley, thank you so much for taking the time. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Once again, that was Mike Lindsley. All right, big thanks to my guest this week, Sedina Parks. She's on Instagram at Sedina Parks. Dan Lest is on Twitter at Sports La Lest. Mike Lindsley, also on Twitter at Mike L Sports. And me, I'm on as well at Sean Crew. Thanks so much for listening. Danny and Gallant are coming up next. It's the Golf Show with Sean Crew on 710 ESPN Seattle.